Thank you very much, Leslie. Welcome everyone to this great, <clears throat> great conference this year. Uh, every year they turn out better than the last. I always think, how can we do a better job, but somehow we manage to. So it's really exciting. And with Kat, and particularly as Kat said, with Leslie as our leaders to put this together, it's pretty hard for it to not come out great. So um, I'm very honored tonight <clears throat> to be introducing our keynote speaker, uh, Melissa Ludke, who in 1977 learned firsthand what it was like to experience gender discrimination through the lens of baseball. That year as a baseball reporter for Sports Illustrated, she became the plaintiff in SI's lawsuit to get her equal access to players for interviews in the team's clubhouses. The outcome of Ludke v. Kuhn allowed Melissa to interview players in both team clubhouses during the 1978 World Series. This episode is clearly important enough to baseball history that Ludke's 1977 World Series Yankee press pass uh, is enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame. <clears throat> now Melissa Ludke finally tells the story that led to the suit which paved the way for women reporters to report alongside men in Major League Baseball locker rooms. Ludke opened pathways for generations of women to work in sports media and her memoir, Locker Room Talk, A Woman's Struggle to Get Inside, is set to be published early next year by Rutgers University Press. Originally from Iowa, but raised in Massachusetts, Melissa Ludke graduated from Wellesley College in Massachusetts with a major in art history and went to work in journalism upon graduation. Equally important to her career has been her work revolving around girls and women's lives. This engagement led her to write the books On Our Own, Unmarried Motherhood in America, published in 1997, followed in 2019 by Touching Home in China in Search of Missing Girlhoods, a powerful so-called China adoptee book that's accompanied by a companion website with videos of the two teenage girls at the heart of her story, plus interactive graphics, photo slideshows, open source lesson plans, and a curated resource library to expand learning on the various topics explored in the book. But sports journalism gave Ludke the career work by which she will likely be best remembered. While writing on our own, she also organized conferences for journalists covering topics such as welfare reform, children's health, and early childhood development, always combining two important threads in her career. She was a domestic correspondent for Time from its New York, Los Angeles, and Boston bureaus, including covering the 1984 Summer Olympics, where she wrote Time's cover story on four gold time medal winner, Carl Lewis. Yet her primary focus at Time then was the social issues. During her career, she covered and worked in political campaigns, taught in higher education, plus served as editor of Neiman Reports at Harvard's Neiman Foundation for Journalism. During all this, women's equality in sports writing was always on her radar. Ludke's career has earned her many awards, including, but not limited to, a front page award from the News Women's Club of New York, the Mary Garber Pioneer Award and Friend of AS, AWSM from the Association of Women in Sports Media, inclusion in the 100 Outstanding Journalists in the US in the last 100 years by the New York University Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. And finally, she was awarded the Yankee Quill Award in lifetime, for lifetime achievement in 2020, known as the highest individual honor for journalists in New England. Without further ado, I'm very honored to welcome the award-winning Melissa Ludke to give our keynote address at this fifth annual conference. Melissa? Thank you, Catherine. My God, I thought I lived a long life, but you may have lived a lot longer.
longer. <laughs> well, it was longer, but I tried to, you know, keep it just to a few minutes. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. It does seem as though this is a good evening and we're going to uh, not end up in a government uh, shutdown. So at least we seem to have some good news coming our way tonight. Um, I must say that it's been a fabulous day uh, to discover the paths that women have carved to bring us to where we are tonight. And I am grateful that these paths have led me to meet um, Leslie Heafy at the Sabre Conference last summer. I must say that her dedication to expanding women's roles in baseball is both captivating and infectious as are the many ways that the IWBC is living out its mission of protecting, preserving, and promoting all aspects of women's baseball. I note both on and off the field. I am honored to be your speaker this evening. So let me get to the next slide and we'll figure this out. So I was thinking how much fun it would have been for us to be together in Rockford, Illinois, sort of celebrating in person the Peaches, visiting their restored uh, Bayer Stadium and wandering through the Girls of Summer exhibit. You know, along the way, we probably would have passed these murals recently painted in the Peaches' honor. And then we'd surely have shared a few of our favorite scenes from A League of, our, of Their Own. Tonight, I'm here to share my story while knowing that it's just one in a long line of stories about women who persisted against the odds and those who still are persisting, like Sophia, who we met this afternoon, to be, be part of a sport that we and they have loved. That's baseball. And in doing this, to do what most people didn't believe that women either could or should do. So it's awesome, absolutely awesome to be in the company of women who figured out how to move past the barriers and live out the dreams that they had as girls. Who isn't inspired by Maybelle Blair? I mean, I loved being able to watch her in the video show her stuff at City Field when the New York Mets honored her this season. And the pitches that Maybelle through in 1948 are alive today in the arms of girls like Jillian Albiati, whose California high school coach handed her the ball as the starting pitcher when she and her team went to the state championship baseball tournament in California. Well, tonight I'm here to report and this is kind of interesting, that Mattel, after creating 172 Barbies with nine different body types, 35 different skin tones, 94 different hairstyles, and after putting Barbie in a hijab, after moving her around in a wheelchair, having her wear a prosthetic leg, and after another Barbie became hearing impaired, well, at last, Mattel has caught up with Maybelle and Jillian by naming this year's career Barbies in honor of women in sports. A general manager, a referee, a coach, and yes, a sports reporter. I don't know about you, but I dressed in pink and went to see the movie Barbie with my 26-year-old daughter. Well, I'm thinking of this mom-daughter movie outing here and here are some of the words that I plucked from that film. They were said by the character who was supposedly the fictional Ruth Handler, the co-founder of Mattel. And she said in that film, we mothers stand still so our daughters can look back to see how far they have come. Let me get down here, okay. So, like my daughter who went to the movie with me this summer, I was 26 years old, her same age, when in October of 1977, I was a reporter with Sports Illustrated magazine. 
and Major League Baseball Commissioner Bowie Kuhn barred me from entering the locker rooms of the two World Series teams, the Yankees and the Dodgers. Of course, my fellow sports writers walked right in, talked with the players, but of course they were all men. So at that moment, I was standing on the shoulders of Mary Garber. Oddly, as Barbie in some ways stands on mine in her recent incarnation as a woman sports writer. Well, I'm not really quite sure what to say next, so let's just push on. Ah, so here's Barbie as an umpire and referee transitioned into our very own Perry Barber. And there's Perry Barber below in that picture lifting up her fellow women umpires in a 2008 exhibition game between the New York Mets and the University of Michigan. On that day, Perry made sure that women became the first all-female crew to umpire a game featuring a major league team. Before saying goodbye to our legacies, Maybelle Blair and Mary Garber, Let's pay tribute to Tibby Eisen. First, a bit of her history. In 1944, Tibby joined the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, where she played 966 games and stole 674 bases. You have to think about that. Yeah, she stole those bases and she didn't have her legs covered in pants. That's impressive. But what she did when this league went away is what I want to talk about now. Tibby was part of the effort to establish the exhibit in the Baseball Hall of Fame that celebrates women in baseball. It opened in 1988. And here's why Tibby said she worked so hard to make this a permanent exhibit. She said, we're trying to record our role in baseball so we have our place in history. It's important to keep our baseball league in the limelight because you see it gets pushed into the background just as women have been pushed into the background forever. If they knew more about our league, perhaps in the future, some women will say, hey, maybe we can do that again. So here's a moment in my life to which I owe Tibby immeasurable gratitude. In 2017, Claire Smith invited me and my daughter, Maya, to be with her to experience her induction as the first woman honored in the Baseball Hall of Fame in the writer's wing. Being with Claire was a thrilling public celebration. But then in a private moment, Maya and I found our way to the women's exhibit at Cooperstown. And there together we saw for the first time my 1977 World Series pass alongside the 1977 clubhouse pass that the Yankees gave me to use before the World Series to report inside of their locker room. And all of this is under a placard describing my legal struggle for equal access. This remains one of my most powerful mother-daughter moments. Just seeing these photographs again has me returning to the wisdom of Ruth Handler's, the fictional Ruth Handler's words. We mothers stand still so our daughters can look back to see how far they have come. And that's Claire Smith, who I know you have honored in the past. And of course, she's sitting next to Rachel Robinson, who joined, was joined her at her induction in 2017. And there below, you will see my daughter at the age of four sitting on my lap at Fenway Park. So let's begin. Except in baseball, you will see that Daughters don't figure very well in the literature about it. Let's take a look at what Donald Hall wrote in 1984. This would have been about, uh, what, six years, seven years after my lawsuit. He wrote, baseball is fathers and sons, the generations looping backward forever with a million apparitions of sticks and balls. 
Baseball is fathers and sons playing catch, lazy and murderous, wild and controlled, the profound archaic song of birth, growth, age, and death. This diamond encircles what we are, joining the long generations of all the fathers and all the sons. Well, try telling this to these women. Or try telling it to Alyssa Nakin, the first woman on-field baseball coach. Or to Kim Ng, the first woman baseball general manager. Or Rachel Balkovic, the first woman minor league manager. Or to these women who have been barrier breakers as official scorers. Or to these women who are pitching baseball today. And certainly, do not try telling this to 11-year-old Ellie Dowdy, who when she heard Melanie Newman doing play-by-play -play at the Baltimore Orioles game, realized that her dream of one day doing Melanie's job might actually come true. You can read below what the two of them said. Melanie said, it's that sorority of women that just makes this what it is. It makes it possible for me to keep going when there are days when I didn't feel like I had it in me. And they reminded we, us, me, we do this for each other. And Dowdy said in this same story, it makes me feel that anything is possible and dreams can come true. Well, here we are. My story about baseball in 1970s America. I'll intersperse this with a few of the cartoons that uh, basically set the scene back then. Ah, the good old days. The locked door, the puzzled woman standing outside. The locker room where women reporters wait here as I did, and you'll see later on in my presentation after game six of the 1977 World Series, there was a concrete wall that I was pushed against then. So that cartoon is um, pretty reminiscent. So let me go back to 1976. And the reason I'm going back there is to try to set the scene for you of what it was like in 1977 when Kuhn made his decision to ban me. In the fall of 1976, I had been assigned by the editor at Sports Illustrated, an editor, to accompany Roger Kahn for two weeks as, a, as his reporter. He was going to be assigned to do stories on the old timers in baseball. And of course he had written the book on the 1955 Brooklyn Dodgers. And um, so he was very familiar with that time. And the first one he set out for us to meet and go to see was Bill Veck, who had uh, uh, was the owner again of the Chicago White Sox. So it was not until I read Roger Kahn's book in October Men in 2004 that I actually found out about what had happened in the press box that night. He did not tell me that. But you may see here, you may have already read it, that I went down to pick up the credentials, walked into the press box with him, and the I in this is uh, Roger Kahn writing about this scene. He went down to sit next to Beck and I put myself up in the second row of the press box. Well, evidently, and I didn't know this at the time, I must have been the first woman who had ever gone into that press box because as Roger wrote, wrote one of the writers came up and said intensely into his ear, your girlfriend doesn't belong here. You know that. What do you think this is? Ladies night at the Turkish bath. So later that night, we were to meet up with Bill Veck in the Bard's room. The men were going to order drinks. I was going to sip a, a seltzer water and take notes in my role as being the reporter. But um, Roger and I got there before most of the other writers because we weren't filing a story. And uh, as the writers came into the room and saw me sitting at a table with Roger, they glared at me. This is what Roger wrote. Again, I didn't learn this until years later. I knew we had to leave, but here's his writing about it. A few sports writers glared at Melissa and then at me. And though I knew some of them, no one offered a nod or even a friendly look. It was as though I had brought a harlot into the temple. And after a bit, the bartender motioned me aside and he whispered, sir, 
your secretary will have to drink in the hall. I snapped, she's not my secretary, she's a reporter, and if she has to drink in the hall, I will drink there too. A phone call he had the next morning with Bill Veck, where Bill Veck first told him that he did not control the room that the writers did, he could do nothing about letting me inside of it. And Roger reminded him that he owned the stadium and that he damn well could do something about having me inside. So the next night I was inside and the two men drank until about two in the morning and I took uh, vigorous notes. So here I am, Sports Illustrated 1977. I think you can tell by the typewriter that we're not uh, in an office today. Now I'm gonna tell you a story from 1977 before the World Series starts. And this is Mickey Morabito, who was the press, uh, rookie press uh, guy, uh, press public relations person for the Yankees that year. And it really made a difference that he was the same age as I was. He was a contemporary. He really listened to me. He understood, he heard me. He wasn't like a lot of the much, much older men who had been public relations people for years who wanted nothing to do with the uh, very few women who were coming in. So Mickey was a great help with me and he was also very, very close friends with Billy Martin, who was the manager of the team. So about midway through the season, after having heard my frustrations about not being able to interview the players, both before the game and after the game in the locker room, most people think about it as just going and getting quotes after the game. But as a magazine writer, the most valuable time to me to be in the Yankees locker room was the 45 minutes between batting practice and the game when not one player changed out of his uniform. But yet I was forbidden to be in the clubhouse at that time when I could actually have the time to talk at leisure with the players. So Mickey, hearing all of this, um, came to me after the uh, break, the midseason break, and he said, listen, let me come in the front door, past the guards, and then I will come out this passageway to the side door. I'll meet you here. You stand at this door, and I will walk you into Billy Martin's office. I won't take you all the way into the locker room, but I'll at least get you into his office, and you can at least have that place to be. Well, I was very much a gradualist. As the only woman in a sea of men, I was not about to make demands. And I think that anyone who worked back in the 70s in an industry which was predominantly men understands my thoughts at that time. So I really wanted to work as best I could within the system and be a gradualist. So I was delighted to go into Billy's office after the game. And frankly, I learned a lot because the reporters would come in from the locker room after talking to the players. They would talk about what the players were saying, ask Billy for his reaction. So I really got a pretty good sense of what was happening. And I figured that if we did that long enough that um, you know things would change and I turned out to be right. We'll see how that works. Just wanna point out that for any of you who haven't been in a baseball locker room, this is essentially the locker room in the middle here and you can see that no reporters, men or women, are allowed to go on the other side of this wall into the area where the showers, the toilet, the saunas, everything about um, the, quote, indecency or the privacy of men might be disturbed. Okay, so I turned out to be absolutely right with my gradualist approach. You will see that on October 1st, and actually the game on October 2nd, the last two games, Mickey Morabito very quietly handed me a daily clubhouse admission pass. He said, you use this pass however you want. He absolutely trusted me. And in fact, because I wasn't writing a story on deadline, I only used the pass before the game to go into that locker room and talk to the players. Again, when they were sitting around signing baseballs, et cetera, I did not want to cause a scene that would change the whole dynamic of the progress that I was making. Again, to be a gradualist, to let them get accustomed to something that they weren't accustomed to, I felt was the best way to go. And in fact, before the World Series happened, I had been in the Yankees clubhouse during the American League Championship Series, and not one reporter wrote about the fact that I was there. 
So it really is a testament that working under the radar screen, not going public and not demanding things that are going to sort of change the routines of people, I felt was really the way to go. We get to the 1977 World Series. You can see here that I've been given a press pass that says I it's good for admission to the stadium, the field, the clubhouse, and the interview room. Of course, the interview room is set up during the larger American League Series and the World Series um, at Yankee Stadium, where they will bring one or two players out. But then the, then the rest of the, uh, the press corps goes into the clubhouse, which includes the locker room afterwards. I was given a press pass where I don't think anyone noticed that they'd written a woman's name on it. And they gave it to me and I looked at it and thought, okay, I have that press pass. Now I'm gonna use it. I knew the Yankees were okay. The Dodgers were playing in it. So I went to the Dodgers. And again, I did this out of courtesy, wanting to do it in a gradualist way where I was working within the system and not bur bursting into a place where I'd be surprising players and probably being thrown out. So I went first to Tommy Lasorda, who I had met with Roger Kahn the year before. He knew me well. He flinched, he turned white, he walked away from me and said, go talk to Tommy John, he's our player rep. He wanted nothing to do with this conversation. Tommy John, on the other hand, was a phenomenally good listener and incredibly wonderful. I was very fortunate that he was the player rep of that team. Uh, on the Monday before the series started, I walked into the dugout with him. We sat and talked for probably 15, 20 minutes. He looked at my past. He talked about the fact that he would be uncomfortable with this, but he personally believed that I had the right to be there, the right to do my job. But he said that he wanted to go back and talk to the other players. He wanted to get a sense of what they thought. And he said he would meet me at the backstop after the uh, batting practice, right before the first game of the World Series. And so um, we had Tuesday and Wednesdays off from work. So I was just home that day, went up to the stadium uh, went to batting practice and met Tommy at the uh, backstop, as he asked. And Tommy said, yeah, he said, listen, it wasn't unanimous. But when we talked about it and then we took a vote, um, a majority of the players said they understand. You have a job to do and they thank you for letting them know that you might be coming in. Um, and so we're on. So I started to walk away and he called me back and he said, I just have a favor to ask you. Would you go and tell our public relations person, Steve Brenner, that um, that we've agreed to this and that you may, in fact, go into the locker room again? I am under no obligation to be his delivery person. I didn't know Steve Brenner, but I spent about the next 20, 25 minutes running around underneath the stadium trying to find Steve so that I could tell him what was happening. Well, that turned out to be my undoing. Because when Steve Brenner found out, he immediately went to the commissioner's office. And it was then that they must have huddled and made the decision that uh, it doesn't matter if the Yankees had given permission. It doesn't matter if the Dodgers had given permission. Bowie Kuhn had not given permission. And as I was told by his lieutenant, uh, Bob Weirs, who you'll see in this next photo, who called me up. Well, now Bob Weirs isn't there, but... Bob Weirs called me up and he said, the commissioner has made this decision. His permission was never granted. You are barred from the locker rooms during the series and you're barred from all baseball locker rooms forever, which meant as long as he was commissioner. And he was very young at the time. So by game six, so game one, I'm barred from it. By uh, the time I get into the magazine on Thursday morning, which is when we resume being in the office, the editor calls me in. He says, I heard there's a bit of an uproar at the stadium about you. What's going on? I tell him what had happened in terms of me being told this by the commissioner. So they began a round of negotiations with the commissioner's office. And we get to game six, which is a week later on that Tuesday night of the 1977 World Series. I'm about to head up to the stadium when my phone rings at home, and it's the attorney from Time Incorporated who'd been in the meeting with my baseball editor, and he says, we've made an arrangement for you. One thing I wanna point out to you is that no one ever invited me to be part of those conversations. 
I was the person who understood the dynamics of what was going on up there. But now I'm being called by the attorney for baseball to tell me what arrangements all of these men have made for me. It turned out that they wanted me to stand in this corridor out here against this wall next to the door of whichever team I wanted to uh, be with after the game, which was going to be game six. Well, that night, Reggie Jackson hit three home runs, won the game for the Yankees. This is the victorious Yankees locker room. You will see no female face in there. You will see TV broadcasters, and there were TV cameras, but um, I was still not in. I was standing out in this corridor, pushed against the wall by fans who had come in through the tunnel, who were screaming, pushing, hollering, trying to get into the locker room. And this man was the man who was given to me as my one and only male escort in life. His job, which was not an easy one that night, was to be my runner. This is Larry Shank, who was the PR director for the Philadelphia Phillies. He was to come to me outside the locker room, ask me who I wanted to speak with, go into the locker room, and then try to appear with that player. So I don't think it's going to take much for any of you to know which player I asked to speak with. Reggie Jackson. Reggie Jackson was otherwise engaged for the next one hour and 45 minutes. In between, I was brought out two players who hadn't even played in the game. I could not hear them. They could not hear me through the concophony of noise reverberating off of these walls. When Reggie finally came out, it was close to midnight, about two hours after the game had ended. He turned to me and he said, Melissa, I've said all I have to say tonight. I'm headed downtown. And that was that. That was game six, 1977 World Series. Here comes my judge. By the end of 1977, negotiations with the commissioner have broken down to such a point that there is no way that the commissioner is going to make any other decision than that the women must be separated from the men. Uh, even though he'd gone to law school, University of Virginia Law School, he was a practicing attorney for many years. I'm not sure that he had read the full opinion of Brown versus Board of Education saying that separate is not equal. Well, there's a woman back there with a little green arrow pointing to her. Her name is Judge Constance Baker Motley. You'll notice that she's both the only woman in the court by the 1970s, having been appointed by, um, by President Johnson in 1966. By 1977, when our case is filed, she is still the only woman to serve on that court in its 189 year history. The Southern District Court of Manhattan is the mother court of our country, the only one founded before the Supreme Court, and she's the first woman to serve on that court. She is also the first Black woman to ever be appointed to the federal bench in the United States. And while we're talking about the separate but equal decision, we should also note that she wrote the legal draft of the legal brief that was used in Brown versus Board of Education when she worked alongside Thurgood Marshall in arguing that case. When they put the names of these judges into this wooden box and they spun the wheel to figure out who would be the judge overseeing my case, Judge Constance Baker Motley's name was pulled out by the clerk of the court. She thus became the judge in my case. And if many of you have listened to Katanji Brown Jackson praise her, you may remember that when she was nominated, Katanji Brown Jackson was nominated, she shares a birthday with Constance Baker Motley and spoke then of standing on her shoulders and saying that had it been a different time, Constance Baker Motley would have been the first black Supreme Court woman judge of our country. You can see her here standing next to James Meredith and she managed against all odds to desegregate Old Miss 
and James Meredith enrolled as the first Black student because of her work in taking that case through the Southern courts and into the Supreme Court. It was one of 10 cases that she won as a woman Black attorney in the 50s and 60s at the Supreme Court. Well, before we get inside Judge Motley's chambers, let's take a little look at what was happening outside her chambers. Peanuts got involved and did a whole bunch of a series of cartoons, of course, on um, this situation. Uh, on The Tonight Show, Johnny Carson did a skit with Betty White, which was uh, ended with Betty White being dressed in a towel and uh, dropping her towel once she got into the shower with Johnny Carson. On Saturday Night Live, O.J. Simpson was the host that night. And of course, Lorraine Newman and he did a very pun-filled skit in the locker room there. Judge Motley heard, the, heard my case on April 14th, 1978. And she made her decision on September 25th, 1978, almost exactly a year after the World Series in which Bowie Kuhn had said that I could not go into the locker rooms. In her order, which was decided based on the 14th Amendment, which she had a lot of experience with, having used it successfully in her own cases on racial discrimination, in getting Charlene Hunter Galt into the University of Georgia, Vivian Malone into Alabama, James Meredith into Mississippi, getting Martin Luther King out of jail in Albany, Georgia and Birmingham, Alabama. And she said her most worthwhile case was getting the thousands of thousand children who had marched in the Children's Crusade in Birmingham, Alabama and faced the fierce dogs that Bull Connor put on them they were expelled from school and she managed to re-enroll every single one of them in school. She decided my case, as I say, on, on September 25th. And her decision, because it was in the district court, only applied to Yankee Stadium and me because of where the uh, incident had taken place. So here you go, here's a sampling of some of the headlines uh, of course, you wouldn't have a headline in this case without some pun on the shape of women or, uh, you know, the word sex in it. What was very rare back in those days and almost never happened was that you saw equal rights in a headline. It was often a story about, well, here's Patrick Buchanan, who we know well, locker rooms fall and no one is safe. Locker room ruling called an ERA preview. My case was decided at the same time that Phyllis Schlafly was beginning to be very successful with her campaign against the ERA. And so there were a lot of columns saying that my, my legal action and my lawsuit and Judge Motley's order was a good reason not to pass the ERA. The only time you started to see the word equal rights or rights was when it's talking about how male sports writers want equal rights to go into the women's locker room. That's it, women get the rights and supposedly some extra thrill. So it all revolved around this notion that Kuhn liked to emphasize that he was concerned about the sexual privacy of his athletes. And you will see that we were often called damsels, girls, rarely, women. So now I'm going to take you back a little bit into mother and daughter in baseball. This is my mother. I was the first of five children born to my parents. They, uh, I grew up in a town of Amherst, Massachusetts, where my father was a professor and my mother became a professor after having her five children. The reason I'm taking you back is because I want to return in a sense to where we started with Donald Hall, his notion that this game is always passed down father to son. Where you see the words pinprick, you will see that there's a little tiny pinprick. And why is that important? That pinprick tells me that this picture of Ted Williams once hung from the wooden cornice 
around my mother's bedroom. My mother was the fourth of, of four children, the third daughter, and she became the one who accompanied her father to Fenway Park, and she fell in love with baseball. She would order the pictures every spring, and she would write down the starting lineups. She would take her thumbtacks, and she would put them all around her wall. She would listen to the radio games, and she would score them. And then she would take the clippings from the papers. There were five Boston papers in those days. And she would put them together in a scrapbook with her scorecard, with the, uh, the stories about them. And when I became a baseball reporter for Sports Illustrated, she brought down to me the three envelopes that she had kept all these years of these pictures with the pinprick. So to me, that pinprick is really... Um, her generational passing down of her love of baseball to me. I was born on May 27th, 1951, but there was no way that my grandfather was going to write a letter before May 30th. Why was that? Because when on the day I was born, the uh, Yankees were getting on a train and on their way up to Fenway Park for three games, including a doubleheader. So he had to wait till that was over to write to his dearest Jean in Iowa, where she had given birth to her first daughter. So he spells my name wrong in the first paragraph and quickly moves on to a rendition or an accounting of the doubleheader. In fact, the Red Sox won three games, sent the Yankees on their way without a win in Fenway Park. But you can see here that he's explaining to my mother who couldn't listen to the games then on the radio from, from the Red Sox to Iowa, it's not like today. So he was talking about how the Red Sox wanged the Yanks twice in a row. Ted Williams hit a home run, the last of the eighth. He banged him to right and center and all over the place. And so this is a letter that I later found when my mother uh, died. She had kept all the letters that she had received when I was born. And this one was in an envelope from my grandfather in Milton, Massachusetts to my mother in Iowa. And when I opened this letter and read it, I understood that when I was born, I had the baseball DNA in me. Well, my daughter and I do not share DNA, but we do share a love of baseball. Here she is again uh, with us in Fenway Park when she was four years old. Uh, during the summers, uh, we would spend our time in the Cape Cod Baseball League where we could pull up our chairs and sit there for free, get a bit of clam chowder, a pretzel, put some money in for a raffle and really enjoy the games. We still go to the minor league games around here, but Fenway Park is a little too expensive right now. So for all, for my daughter, for all of the daughters who are now crawling around, may they one day find themselves as Beth Movens has, as these women have, there's a producer, a woman producing hockey, Aaron Andrews on the football field, producers behind the scenes at sporting events, and my great, 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 great friend who I admire so much, Susan Waldman, who's just completed her 15th year with the New York Yankees as a radio uh, color announcer. So, I have written this book, Locker Room Talk, A Woman's Struggle to Get Inside. I will tell you right now that if you order the book, which I hope you will at some point, this will not be the cover. I just learned that two weeks ago that uh, I made this up as my cover when I was writing it to kind of inspire me, but you'll see a different cover on it, same title and the rest. But I wanna say that I'm dedicating this talk to Katie Casey. And here we go. I'm gonna have Carly Simon, whoops, whoops, let me get us back here. I'm gonna have Carly Simon take us out. No, why not? It's not working. 
It should have been working. Okay, forget it. It sounds squeaky, but I'm gonna just remind all of you who don't who know the chorus to take me out to the ball game, but who don't necessarily know the actual verses to it. It turns out that Jack Norwell wrote about a young woman who was baseball mad back in 1908. And those those actual verses go, Katie Casey was baseball mad. She had the fever and she had it bad. Just to root for the hometown crew, every cent that Katie spent. On one Saturday, her young beau called to see if she'd like to go to see a show, but Miss Kate said, no, I'll tell you what you can do. And then it's take me out. I'm a terrible singer, so I'm not gonna impose that on you. But that's where he got the song, the chorus that we all sing. And I heard that some of you are planning to sing on that bus, that Peaches bus, the take me out to the ball game. And I wish that my Carly Simon rendition actually worked, but it doesn't. So uh, let me go out of sharing and uh, we can see if there are any questions that anyone has. Thank so. you, Melissa. There, that was that was amazing. And um, if I could sing, I would help you, but you don't want to hear me either. Oh, no. So there were a couple of questions that came up in the chat, and um, I will watch to see if others. But the first one came from Tracy, and she said, "Well, you had the support of the Sports Illustrated Sports Illustrated Brass. Do you feel you had support of others in the newsroom?" Well, you know, this is an interesting question. I'm going to share it with you because I write about it in the book. I have not really written about it before. Um, one of the reasons, it's, it gets a little complicated, but let me take you a little back in history of that time. In 1970, the women at Newsweek sued Kay Graham, who owned the Newsweek at the time through the Washington Post. They sued her because... If you looked at hiring practices, promotion practices, and pay, they could document that women who came in with the same experience in education got lesser jobs, lesser pay, and less opportunity for promotion. That was the first sort of group gender uh, legal case that went out into the world. Eleanor Holmes Norton was their attorney in 1970. They won it, but then they had to go back and sue Newsweek again because Newsweek didn't respond even though they had been told to respond. That happened in 1970. It got a lot of attention. In 1971, the women at Time Incorporated followed Newsweek's lead and 136 women signed their names to a document, a petition, arguing the same thing at Time. The men at Time, who were all men who were leading Time Inc. at the time, agreed to sign a conciliation agreement without recognizing any fault at any of the things that they were charged with. But they signed a conciliation agreement that pledged them to support uh, their women and to hire them, to promote them, and pay them at commiserate with the men. So it's pretty important to understand that background. So Time Inc. had been sued by its own women at the beginning of that decade. So now I'm in a situation where uh, I am a woman who's working at Sports Illustrated. I'm a reporter, researcher reporter, which is kind of the lowest rung. And it was always my belief that one of the reasons that Sports Illustrated and then Time Inc., the motherboard company was the one who hired my attorney, F.A.O. Schwartz Jr., who was their outside counsel to represent me. I always believed that without that conciliation agreement signed, without that pressure, I'm not sure that they would have done it. Now, why do I set that up that way to tell you that? I do because about a year after this suit was saw was a uh, was taken, you know, I won the suit. Uh, I decided to leave sports writing. I felt like I really had done what I set out to do. I felt like I wanted a new challenge. And I felt, frankly, that I just wanted to kind of leave sports behind and take what I had learned in journalism 
and do it in a different place. So I went to CBS News and I found out that at CBS News, it was the same thing. I was hired as a researcher. The assistant producers were all men. They seemed to have the same background I did. So I was no longer complacent. I went to the vice president of CBS News and I said, I should be an associate producer. I should not be a researcher with the skill sets that I'm bringing to you. He said, it's not going to happen. So I made the decision to leave CBS News. I wasn't going to invest more time at the age of 30 at that point in trying to work myself up the ladder. So I called Sports Illustrated and asked if I could come back. The baseball season was starting again, and they were thrilled to have me back. I know it seems like a long story, but I'm getting to a point here. Stay with me. So um, I'm ready to come back. They set the time. I'm going to go in on a Thursday. I'm going to meet with the HR people, sign the papers, and I'm going to start in my old job and be right back on the baseball beat. And I'm very happy and all of that. I get a call and I'm asked to come in to see the editor of a baseball editor on a Saturday afternoon. I walk into his office on Saturday and soon I see the assistant managing editor following me into the office and closing the door, never a good sign. It turns out that Roger Angel had been working on a piece called Sharing the Beat in which I had talked to him in the fall before I was planning on leaving. And they opened the story and read from me one paragraph in which I said the following. I said that I believed that Time Inc. had supported my lawsuit as recognition of their earlier conciliation agreement when women had sued the company. I did believe it. I said it. And then I said, even though my suit has been filed, I didn't feel like the basic workings of the magazine had changed. So they read that back to me and they said, well, there's going to be a condition on you returning to work for us. And that is that you're going to have to say that you were misquoted and you're going to have to say those things in any speeches that you continue to give or interviews. And I said, I refuse to do that. I said those things. I believe those things. And so I walked out that day and, of course, burst out crying when I got out of the building onto the sidewalk, but I never went back to Sports Illustrated and I kind of had to regroup and figure out what my next step was. So it's a long-winded answer. So yes, I believe that Time Inc. was terrific in supporting my suit. I will tell you that when I was assigned to go over and do a live interview for six minutes on um, the Today Show live with Jane Pauley, three days after the suit was filed, not one person from Time Inc. worked with me to prepare me for that interview. Not one person came over with me to work on that and do that interview. So um, it's a very nuanced answer. It has to be. I can't give you an answer that says, you know, oh, weren't they wonderful to to back me? So I hope that it wasn't. Yeah but it has to be complicated. And I do write this in the book. Thank you. That was great. Um, and no, it makes sense that it would be that way. So Donna uh, Muscarla asks, did any of the players express disapproval of your ban? Did any of the players express disapproval of my what? Of your ban, of the fact that you weren't allowed in the locker rooms? No, not that I ever saw. Okay. <laughs> Not, not surprised. <laughs> we were kind of hoping they might have, but <laughs> um, on you see Steve Garvey, who was terrific because Claire Smith, who I mentioned earlier in this, Claire was covering the uh for the New York Times. No, I guess think she was either at the Hartford Current or the New York New York Times, I think. And she was covering the National League series in 1984. She was in Chicago and San Diego won the game and she was supposed to try to go into the locker room. And um, the players in there had a number of John Birchers who were part of that group. She was an African-American woman and she got she got literally carried out of the locker room. The manager, um, Jean Mock, did not stand up for her. And so she was out in the corridor not knowing what she was going to do to try to file that night's story. 
And Henry Hecht, who was from the post, came around the corner and saw her in tears and said, what can I do? What can I do, Claire? What help do you want? She said, can you go get me Steve Garvey, who she'd known well from the Dodgers. Steve had been traded to the Padres. And Steve Garvey came out and said, Claire, you've got to stop crying. I'll do whatever I can do for you. I'll help you. What, what players do you need? What quotes do you need? I'll do whatever you want. So, you know, I'm just saying that this thing evolves over time where you begin to have a different consciousness that comes into play as this, as this um, policy gets more and more sort of ingrained in the sport. But I would say early on, there was more a fear by a lot of women, including me, that when you walked into a new clubhouse, you expected that you were going to get some players who were going to try to act out with you as their foil. And it was going to be more trying to figure out if they crossed a line that you felt they shouldn't cross with you, rather than looking for great support from a player. That makes sense. Thank you. Um so another question that came up um, from Donna Helper was asking about whether you found that there were other women journalists, et cetera, who supported your efforts, or was it more that they may have but were afraid to speak up on your behalf? They absolutely did, uh, by and large. And again, I write about this um, extensively in my book because my lawyer uh, any lawyer who's preparing a case in a federal court is going to get a range of affidavits to support their testimony because they have a very short time in the hearing. So they need to convey things like what is the experience of women reporters. And I think many of you know that prior to my being kicked out by the baseball commissioner, both the Hockey League and the NBA had both opened their locker rooms and provided equal access to women reporters. So women who had had that experience, uh, whether it was Jane Gross, uh, Robin Herman, Sheila Moran, um, I think Colleen Elliott, uh, there were a number of women, you could kind of count the dirty dozen or whatever on our hands, but all but one of them agreed to uh, write affidavits on support of me. I think we had maybe five or six women who wrote of their experiences absolutely terrific and absolutely fundamental to us winning our case to get across their experiences. There was one woman named Anita Martini who I had befriended in Houston. She was a local TV person in Houston. And I really liked Anita a lot, but um, Anita just didn't believe that women belonged in the locker room. She just didn't believe it. And she wrote an affidavit on behalf of baseball. Um, now, it's interesting, and I do write this again, uh, that uh, if you go ahead and another like eight, let's see, I think it's seven years ahead, she is now covering uh, football for um, for one of the um, other stations in Texas. And in fact, she is making the argument in a story that women need access to the locker room. And in fact, she is in the locker room interviewing players. So again, it's an evolving thing, but Anita absolutely wrote that she did not think this should happen. And she represented the view of a minority of, uh, of women sports writers, but she was the poster girl for baseball in that. Okay. And I guess no surprise that you'd find some on, on both sides of the, of the picture. Um, so Mary Shea asked a question, and it's more of a sort of a looking back a what if for you. Um, and so it might not be something, but she wondered what you would have done. Would you have given up if the judge had ruled against you? You know, that's really an interesting question and one that, guess what, I've never thought about. Oh, that's awesome. Never... Anyways, yeah. And it wasn't because it was a slam dunk case. There are many people who looked at Constant Baker Motley's record uh, in her record in terms of her racial discrimination cases and her use of the 14th Amendment that believed that if she was presented with a case involving the 14th Amendment, that plaintiffs would overwhelmingly win in her courtroom. Well, actually, there's been a study done of all of her rulings across a number of factors and if you look at the cases involving discrimination in the 14th Amendment, she ruled more over the course of her career for the defendants than she did for the plaintiffs. 
So it wasn't because it was a slam dunk. I think that I didn't ever get to that point because I sat through the hearing. And as you read my book, you will also sit through the hearing and you will see the effectiveness of my lawyer's argument. And you will see the ineffectiveness of baseball's argument. So even though there was no assuredness of what her ruling would be, and there wasn't an assuredness when baseball appealed it for a summary judgment before three judges from the appellate court, I might add all three white men, baseball was sure that these men would help them out and they would certainly overturn her decision, but they didn't. They upheld it 3-0. And it was a couple months later that baseball decided not to take it to the full appellate court. I do want to point out that uh, Donna has mentioned Allison Gordon and her series that she wrote about. Right. And Allison Gordon was a very, very dear friend of mine. I was so happy when the Toronto Blue Jays came to town because <laughs> Allison would be there. It would be another woman up there. And Allison was just a... a fireworks. I mean, she was great. She was funny. She was just fabulous, a fabulous person. And I, she is one of the three women I dedicate my book to. So I just want to say that uh, she was a great, great friend. I miss her terribly. And I wish she were still with us. Yeah. Others are agreeing with you in the chat. Um, most of the rest of what's in the chat, you're going to be able to read accolades to everything you said. There was one interesting comment from Cecilia, and it's just a comment that she mentions that in 2006, when the US uh, TA, right, still uh, banned, and this was 2006, women from the um, ceremony for the Billie Jean King Stadium, and then later apologized after the fact, but that was 2006. <laughs> and yeah. so... Yeah, I wasn't actually aware of that or aware of the year. But, um, you know, I will say maybe a little bit in closing here that I've had a little bit of a sort of Rip Van Winkle experience with this, um, you know, because my case was much ballyhooed and the decision was, of course, open the doors for a lot of women to start coming in and seeing themselves, you know, as that young girl Ellie now sees herself being able to come into Melanie's seat. It truly did open doors for a lot of women who could then see themselves moving into sports media. But, you know, it's so interesting because changing the law is one thing, but right. changing attitudes takes a whole lot longer. And I would argue that it is really as we approach the 2018, 19, 20, just in the last few years. And if you look at my slides earlier with Kim Ng and Alicia and you know, you name it, that's all within the last five, six years that that has started to happen. And that you've seen more women coming into CEOs, presidents, you know, front office positions, coaches you've seen a lot more women coming into coaches you've seen a lot more women uh you know playing baseball uh you know on the men's teams on affiliates of major league teams it really is as though you could have slept for almost 40 years and then woken up and suddenly kind of seen this this blossoming you know of it mm -hmm. why did that happen at that time I don't know. I haven't really given the kind of thought I need to to that, but I've got some time before my book comes out to figure yeah. that. Well, but the overwhelming sentiment, Melissa, is this was an incredible presentation and everyone can't wait to read your book because it's a fascinating and such an important story. Um, and we really, really all want to say thank you so very much for an absolutely superb presentation tonight. And so thank you for sharing with us. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me, Leslie. I mean, the serendipity of us meeting, <laughs> going down to Sabre and you and I just having that experience there and staying in touch and now opening it up to this wider community. You know, you guys have got me and not going away. So um, <laughs> I'd love to see you all next year.